Well, ahoy, wooden boat fans, and welcome to our old Soapbox Derby friends as well. I'm Rich Johnson, and what we have in store for this episode of Journey of Sailing Yacht Syrinx is a little bit of a mashup. Uh, in the first half, we're going to show you a wind tunnel that we built for Soapbox Derby. It's pretty interesting, and how it's now playing a supporting role in our uh, boat building project. And then in the second half, we're going to take you through some work we've been doing on the boat and the boat shed and some pretty interesting discoveries that we found along the way. So come on along. Well, here's today's job. Um, nine years ago, when we were racing Soapbox Derby and just getting started in the um, laydown divisions, um, we built a something I don't think any other team has ever done as far as I'm aware. We built a full-size wind tunnel um, capable of fitting a car and driver um, and it proved valuable as we developed um, five different lay down cars uh, it takes up a ton of room like it put together it's 24 feet long taken apart it takes in three sections it takes up an entire bay of our garage and I need this space uh, to put the um, bows together for the boat shed in addition these windows on the test section, of which there are three big plexiglass wood frame windows, are going to go into the boat shed um, to give us light and allow us to open it up and ventilate it. Before taking this, uh, or getting rid of the, the wind tunnel, I'm going to take it outside, put it together, shoot some video, uh, and um, get some last video of it before I take it apart. So, um, more on that in a minute. All right, so here is our wind tunnel, um, and uh, uh, this is the this is the venturi end where the air gets sucked in and sped up. Um, it goes through a, a wall of draws which straighten the flow, and then we've got about a ten foot set test section, and then we've got the the fans at the other end. Ronan, uh, what do you remember about building this thing? Uh, well, I mean, the main thing I remember was putting 6,400 straws right there. <laughs> yeah, that took a whole, uh, the straws were half inch uh, diameter by, I think, 10 inch uh, drinking straws that we put layer after layer with beads of silicone caulk, and it took, I think, a whole Saturday yeah. afternoon for <laughs> UI and Willa to put it together. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I got, I climbed inside of there one time, and uh, I mean, that was pretty fun. <laughs> we fired <laughs> it, it up. Crazy. <laughs> didn't have you in the car. It'd be yeah. a little hard to get you in there. But uh, we did have you in the tunnel and the tunnel running. You can see what it felt like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a good experiment. I think we all learned a little bit of something about aerodynamics and mechanics and uh, um, built it in 2015 to 2016, modified it a couple times to make it more accurate, and... Uh, it was a, an interesting part of our soapbox der derby journey. <laughs> yeah, sure was. All right, we'll show you how it works. So here's the power for the wind tunnel. Um, when we first built the wind tunnel, it had uh, just half a dozen uh, off-the-shelf 24-inch uh, drum fans that I uh, picked up at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever they were on sale. Um, they had little quarter horsepower, fractional horsepower, uh, um, softball size motors spinning these fans, big gaps at the end of the blades, and they didn't move a lot of air um, when we first built it. It was very disappointing, the performance. I think we could only get like 12 miles an hour out of it or something like that. And, um, nowhere near the promised air on the box, by the way. Um, so, went ahead over the next few months and replaced them with these um, one horsepower large um, industrial drum fan motors um, had to make these mounts out of threaded rod that that kind of hang them in the middle we also put these um, liners into the drums with with foam and, and tape um, the orange is just to kind of keep everybody's hands out of here. We removed the grates also for performance, so you got to be careful when you're running it. You do not want to put your hand anywhere near this. Um, and through all of that and tuning the, the blades, um, we 
got the the flow up into the 18 19 mile an hour range with 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 the flow straightener higher than that um, with with the flow straightener out uh, closer to 30 miles an hour um, so yeah th this is it um, they these six motors draw a lot of amperage um, I'll, I'll show you over here on the on the power panel yeah so coming around the side of the fan section um, this is the power panel and um, uh, all six of those motors, the cords lead in here, and they're they're numbered so we can uh, operate them in, in two two banks um, to have either half speed or full speed and still pretty even flow. Um, the uh, um, they're they're going through these large, I think they're ten gauge uh, cords that come out of out of here, and each. Um, circuit has to be operated on its own 20 amp circuit and I still occasionally have pop circuit breakers this it uh, turns out that a wind tunnel draws a lot of flow <laughs> to move even air at 30 miles an hour um, I know here in Seattle area the Boeing company who I work for has a large wind tunnel and when it runs it's the largest power consumer in King County uh, so we tend to run it at times when there aren't high power draws so uh, on a minor scale we found out the same thing so here's the test section and one of the reasons we're taking the tunnel apart is we need the garage space for working on the boat shed and and other house projects um, um, but we're also going to take the three big plexiglass windows here and use them for windows in our new boat shed um, and then the center section um, I'm going to just put some crossbars into and end up using that as a lumber rack in the boat shed. Um, so most of the wood on here is going to get recycled. So here's kind of the most important um, part of the wind tunnel and it's this drag balance and when we would operate the tunnel this would actually sit down below on the ground um, below the tunnel and we would normally operate this on a concrete slab in our garage not out here on the gravel but I wanted to get this out here where we could film it better. Um, this is separated from the tunnel so the the vibration from the fans does not affect the measurement and what this device does this blue box in here is a very accurate drag balance um, and it is connected to the car via this um, turn this uh, bell crank and this is a ball bearing bell crank we built that m multiplies it's a two to one ratio so a pound of drag on the car or a gram of drag <laughs> would be two grams on this scale um, and this has in turn a, a Bluetooth um, a Bluetooth transmitter that sends uh, this is built by Pasco scientific by the way and it sends it to uh, the Pasco software on the iPad and will allow you to record drag over a period of time. You can you can trace fluctuations and this allows us to measure drag to about at least a tenth of a gram, really more than more accurate than that, but at least a tenth very repeatedly. Um, one of these cars has, when going at 30 miles an hour, has around a kilogram of drag just to put it in perspective. So when we're making minor aerodynamic changes we're measuring fractions of a gram um, and this was the most valuable way we had in the tunnel of, of, uh, of um, measuring the results of what we were experimenting with. Alright so the way the wind tunnel works um, uh, particularly for measuring drag, aerodynamic drag, is we hang the car from the four very fine piano wires. They start here with a guitar tuner which lets us adjust the tension on the wire and they go up, each one goes up through a pulley and then down through a slot in the glass, in the plexiglass, and then through an eye hook onto the end of the axle. We lift with the guitar tuners until the car is barely off the ground uh, and each wheel is off the ground exactly the same amount, about the thickness of a playing card. Once it's hanging, um, and the, the, by the way, the, the wires are angled slightly so that it makes it stable so it won't 
want to hunt around like this when the wind's blowing, the wind tunnel's on. Um, and it's, that's worked really well. Um, when it is hanging, it has virtually no, no um, force whatsoever to move it forward or back. And so the only thing preventing it from moving backwards in the wind is the tie rod coming off the nose and onto that bell crank. Um, it goes through the bell crank, two to one uh, increase in force down to the force transducer, Bluetooth to the iPad, and we can record drag over a period of time. It's important that you measure it not just at one instant in time, but over a period of time because there are fluctuations uh, and you, you want to kind of take a time averaged number. Um, it can, at the bottom line, it lets us measure drag on one of these soapbox derby cars to a fraction of a gram very accurately, very repeatably. The gantry over the test section is there to support the um, the uh, piano wires. I We wanted to have a long length of wire um, leading down to the axles. Um, the longer the length, the less force it takes to move the car and we wanted to have zero resistance. So that's that's why it has the high gantry overhead. Almost forgot to install one of the most important pieces of equipment and that's the anim anemometer which measures wind speed. So we've got a fitting in here that allows us to hang down behind the car where it won't affect the test flow and tells us roughly how fast the tunnel's moving. So this is our trusty uh, wind tunnel derby uh, driver, Racer X. Um, actually has a mannequin head in there just so we don't have any unusual things with the aerodynamics. And for those not familiar with derby, that is the, the, the vision slot that you look through and the head is held in place by the helmet. Um, we have a backrest that positions our drivers very um, stably um, so that their eye and their eye lines allow them to see down the track and to the um, tips of the wheels. All right, run lower, lower down and let's uh, get, get it locked in and ready to run. moment of truth. We're firing up the fan. Here's a really cool set of streamlines. We've got one kind of above the car by about a foot, one about even with eye level, a little bit uh, to the left, and then another one about even with the middle of the car. And now watch when they come along here. Um, you can see the middle one going right in front of the red letters. Um, hopefully with the light I put on, you can see with the shadows. But uh, you can see it them tracing out the streamlines. None of those are touching the car. They're all held in place by the airflow around the car, so it's a very true indication of the type of flow you've got going on and the level of turbulence. Um, and, and it's clear that the strings at the end are, are oscillating a little bit, um, but uh, there's a little bit of turbulent flow there, of course, that's after the helmet.
Here's one last method um, of flow visualization, and that's tufts. So we've got little tufts of, of cotton thread attached to different parts of the uh, body and airfoil. And um, you can see them flickering. And the more, the more you've got, like that, the one in the very back, uh, you can see really going crazy. You've got a lot of turbulence there. And that's, that's coming off the bottom of the car up over the airfoil and, uh, and, and, and uh, or over the top of the airfoil there. So um, you can see the turbulence. Normally you would put these pretty densely over an area. Maybe the tufts are a little slightly shorter than what I cut here, but just another way you can uh, visualize flow in a wind tunnel. What's it in there? <laughs> so bottom line, was it worth building a soapbox derby wind tunnel? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we raced in a lot of big races over the years. Well, won, won a lot, lost a few. Um, there were lost to cars that I'm pretty certain were never in a wind tunnel. Um, did we learn anything? Yeah, we did. We learned things about our airfoils and how we integrate them with the body and other subtle details and small details do matter in Soapbox Derby. Um, but was it absolutely essential to winning? No, I don't think so. Uh, now, do I regret building a Soapbox Derby wind tunnel? Heck no. Um, it was a lot of fun, great project with the kids, learned a little something about science, um, caused me to do a little bit of thinking about uh, the aerodynamics of our cars uh, that I might not have otherwise done. Uh, and so yeah, it was a great, great uh, memories and uh, I'm gonna miss having a, a, a wind tunnel, um, but all things change with time. So we are fairly soon getting ready to build the boat shed. The last of the materials are just about here. Drawings, I'll show those in a minute, are um, complete. Um, and that includes a stairway and a platform uh, to go around the boat, and some safety rails. Um, it, it broke my heart to have to put a tarp over Syrinx. Um, I love looking out the window every morning and seeing her lines. and. Uh, but had to do it. Um, she was leaking badly from the top and when I sealed the boat up over in Port Townsend to get her ready to move, um, it, it, I inadvertently created a sauna by closing the windows and taping off the openings with Visqueen on the top. There's just no ventilation and um, when she got here uh, there was just condensation all over the inside and all windows and everything, even along the, uh, the, the overhead. Um, so needed to stop the water from coming in the top. Water would come in the top. I really saw, found this the first couple of rainstorms. We had it would come in the top, go all over the place, and then eventually drain out of a million holes in the in the planking planks where you know the, the, there isn't uh, caulking in there right now. And and we've got rust streaks where you can see it coming coming down from all the rust on the on the uh, mainly on the floors, and it's just getting washed out of these holes and. Um, needed to stop that, so I put a put a tarp over her. That tarp will be there until the the boat shed is up, which will be hopefully fairly soon. One of the first jobs I chose to take on was um, just removing a test section of the fiberglass deck to expose uh, the deck underneath and and see what we're dealing with. I knew she was originally laid with a teak, a solid teak deck, and wanted to see. Um, what, what we would find underneath the plywood and fiberglass deck that had been applied about uh, 15 years back. Looks like it's two layers of um, two layers of marine plywood, but both about an eighth, eighth inch thick. The first layer is epoxied and held in place with these um, 
three quarter inch. careful getting these out. You gotta really get a hold of the shank with the, with the cat paw. But these are these three quarter inch copper ring shank nails. And uh, they're a pain to get out. <laughs> um, and since it's glued on, this is gonna be quite a job. I'm gonna have to do some thinking about how to get this off efficiently. All right, well, we finished uh, planing and sanding off the um, very difficult to remove layer of uh, marine plywood, and we're down to the original deck and um, covering boards, king planks. Um, I'm just gonna apply a quick coat of boat soup uh, just to kind of uh, get a better look at the wood. Um, this is, um, any who, follow wooden boat building know what boat soup is there's a whole bunch of different recipes the recipe I prefer is um, uh, starts with a, about 45 percent tongue oil 45 percent um, high quality um, turpentine and then about 10 percent um, Stockholm or uh, pine tar um, it gives it a nice smoky flavor um, I like a lot of the recipes include um, uh, linseed oil instead of tongue oil and I I, I believe tongue oil uh, resists mold a little better but that's I could be wrong about that but uh, in this part of the country I've seen linseed oil uh, in exterior applications um, develop mold spots and I, I think tongue oil is less prone to that so anyway we put that on here already shook this all up let's see Looks good. <laughs> I would never varnish a teak deck, but uh, I could be convinced to put oil on it. Especially thinned out, but I'm sure there's lots of opinions. Please feel free to share those with me in the comments. Get a little conversation going here. In our boat building community. All right, let that soak in for a little bit. Well, here's the final result of our little experiment. Um, for given its age and History, uh, um, teak looks pretty decent. Um, no signs of rot. That's the first good thing. Um, certainly a few repairs here and there. Um, what we've got here is is uh, three of probably five or six, I think there's six, probably six king planks, unless this is one big one in the middle, and there'd be five. Uh, nib end, this is a sprung deck. Here's the deck strakes covering board. All this material I think started as five quarter inch and a quarter. Um, it's been sanded over the years and it's more like an inch and an eighth. Um, the white uh, lines you see are 5200 um, I think. Uh, I found a box down below deck that had uh, some 5200 and old uh, West System epoxy and micro balloons. Um, I think all that came from this deck project which was the last big work done on her um, so yeah overall encouraging all right well just to put a bow on the <laughs> the the deck experiment here um, uh, it was a good news bad news story the good news is uh, uh, it is a, a solid teak deck below and in decent shape it's there to be uncovered um, it's a sprung deck, which I was hoping for. I think that's what Berthen usually used on the gauntlets, and um, it's my favorite way to line out a deck. I think it 
really complements the the lines of the boat. Um, the um, the discouraging element is um, the the way they applied the um, the fiberglass and plywood deck. It's really difficult to get off. Um, it's it's a it's epoxied directly to the teak. I think it's one layer of eight, and then copper nails and another layer of eight epoxied with staples on top of that. And it took me three hours to remove this one strip um, with with chisel, um, trying to not gouge the deck, um, which I did a pretty decent job of. I got one little nick right here and learned the hard way. I gotta be really careful. Um, it's a, uh, and then it's, it's planes and sanding uh, to try to get it down. I'm gonna have to figure out a much better way to do this at scale. As you can see behind me, I've got about 500 times this much left to do. So I did, unless I wanna spend a year taking this deck off, it's gonna, I'm gonna have to come up with a better way. And I'm open to suggestions uh, in the comments, please. Um, I'm also gonna be consulting with my network of uh, shipwright friends <laughs> in some of the forums probably but anyway uh, it's generally a good news story um, it's I think the potential here is to have a really beautiful teak deck hey, another place I've been uh, doing some experimenting and um, removing finishes to see what's under is here on the hull so I've um, taken off the finisher on the deck in one of these Dutchman repairs and uh, you know and in a few other places too and everywhere I've looked the teak is solid uh, rot free um, it looks like it's going to be good to work with um, I've also looked at the keel and I've learned a lot about the keel since the last few episodes so um, where we were down in the bilge in uh, in in the salon area um, and I thought it was concrete. Um, it is actually the top of this keel beam right here. And um, the, it, it sits at about right here, just about halfway, a finger's length up the garboard. So um, if I pull the garboard, um, I will be able to see, and, and the keel and the deadwood, I will be able to see all four sides of that keel. But um, what I have seen so far, I have not seen any um, major checking in the keel itself. There is some in, in, in um, some of the bow timbers and definitely in the stern timbers, but the keel, and that's good because this keel is solid teak. It's about 17, or actually probably closer to 19 inches wide, maybe a lot wider than that in the middle. It's very wide, probably came from a two foot wide um, beam. Um, I don't know if it's free of heart or not. It does. It does have a, a few knots in it, which would I'd probably want to put Dutchman in. Um, uh, but it's 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 very wide. It's about nine inches thick and and length. It's got to be 35 feet, you know, 34 five feet long. It's it's a a huge piece of timber that would be very difficult to repair. So if we can reuse this teak keel, that's going to be great. Obviously. The dead wood on both ends is, is going to have to be replaced. Um, and I am going to be dropping uh, or lifting the boat off the keel uh, in order to check the um, keel bolts. So um, I've also scraped finish here and uh, uh, just a little bit. I'll, and for those that are worried, I'm going to contain all of the scrapings when I'm doing this at scale. I'm just doing a few test areas. Um, and again, it, it, the places I've scraped along the keel, it looks pretty solid. It's got a crusty finish. It's going to need to be finished up, but it doesn't have a lot of checking in it. So these Dutchman repairs, um, which typically are in rows of four, they start about halfway down the stem and go about two-thirds of the way back. Um, and on both sides of the boat, they have... Um, they were put in place at some point um, probably to try to brace up the bottom of the boat. They, they, um, they go through the, um, the boat has alternating um, 
frames. It has large frame, small frame, large frame, small frame, uh, and I believe they're all sawn. Um, and the large frames are where these these Dutchmen are picking up, and they go these bolts um, go through the floors. And I have used this rare earth magnet um, kind of to go over the boat looking for ferrous fasteners, and this is where. I find most of them, every one of these repairs was done with, I, they, were, they were all done at the same time, I'm sure, and using um, probably galvanized uh, um, bolts. Um, there aren't many others, like when I go to just the normal fastenings on all the um, planks, I'm not getting anything. I found a handful, but, but and they're all, you know, where there's an obvious repair, but um, uh, plan is to get rid of all the ferrous fasteners. This is pretty interesting. I'm not an expert on um, um, on, on iron sickness, but um, th this this graving piece is is a uh, um, is teak and uh, solid, and it's around this very rusty ferrous fastener. It's discolored and punky and um, it's like it's done a number on this graving piece. So, um, I'm gonna take this out. That's what I've been working on here. Take this out just to uh, um, see how these are structured. Um, but these these are definitely gonna come out. I may end up having to, to re do repairs here to get a, a proper uh, bronze fastener put back in place and, and make sure it's got some something to give it some purchase. For those that don't know why we use slotted screws on boats, this is why. When you go to take it out, you can clean the slot out. And in theory, it makes it uh, easy, the easy, they're the easiest type to remove. This is a handy tool. I got 20 years ago when I was working on older cars a lot and bikes and uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, hammer activated impact driver um, it works well for getting screws and things unstuck a little bit gentler than an impact wrench All right, here's a close-up of that uh, that Dutchman repair, of which there are a ton of on the boat here, all the same kind. Um, it was a pretty nice job. Uh, it's a solid piece of teak. Um, it uh, generally intact, except for around the um, around the fastener. This here's a very rusty um, flathead fastener. Um, it's so rusty, uh, I can't even tell what kind of head it has on it, but probably doesn't matter because it's gonna have a vice grip head on it <laughs> when we go to take it out. Um, they uh, each are held in place with four um, brass, uh, one uh, about um, three quarter inch uh, flathead screws. Those are all in nice shape, easy to remove. And the good, the, the really important thing is the plank around it, um, with the exception of a little bit of punkiness at the hole where this very rusty fastener is going through, um, it's it's fairly intact. So it, I have hope that I'm, I I may be able to save these um, these these teak planks that um, would be extremely difficult to, uh, and expensive to replace. I would probably have to replace it with a different kind of wood. That's still to be determined. We're going to have to strip all the paint off and, and, and do a really thorough examination. I don't want to jump to conclusions, but it is encouraging that, that the, around this graving piece, it, it's not all rotten or, or, or anything. Um, seems to have kept the water out pretty decently. Well, a little while back when we were um, starting to clean up the boat, had a really interesting discovery. Um, as many know, uh, it's a tradition in uh, sailing vessels to, when stepping the mast, to include a coin uh, underneath the mast, uh, down in the mast step. 
Um, this tradition goes back thousands of years. I, I understand that coins were found on uh, in Roman boats and Viking boats um, and uh, the idea is that it buys you safe passage and uh, and uh, pays your way into the afterlife if needed. Um, so uh, I was looking around in the mast step and it's very rusty down there just a orange with rust and and I spotted a round outline and it was this coin a very rusty it was actually kind of blackish rusty um, took it inside and um, couldn't tell what it was um, kind of gently wire brushed it with a back brass brush put in some vinegar um, or just to and then finally had to brush it just a bit more and it is an 1812 English half pence um, half penny um, it was a commemorative coin um, it has Lord um, Horatio um, Nelson on um, one side and his ship uh, the HMS Victory flagship of the English fleet on the other and it's a commemorative coin for the Battle of Trafalgar um, where the English uh, um, were victorious but at the cost of Admiral Nelson's life um, and so this coin was minted uh, just a few years after that event and uh, so it's a pretty special coin um, and I can assure you she will be going back um, in uh, uh, the mast step when we eventually have a mast. <laughs> um, I do understand that the tradition at um, Bertham Yachts uh, had, had been to deliver the boats with a gold sovereign so I don't know if this is original or was put there sometime after um, but it, however it is it's a uh, it's a, a nearly a or more than a 200 year old 212 year old coin at this point and um, it's pretty cool pretty cool thing to find all right well one last thing I want to um, uh, share with you is uh, progress on the boat shed uh, finished up the detailed drawings and um, what we ended up with is a 20 foot by 44 foot boat shed. Um, syrinx will um, be slightly off center in the boat shed um, so that we can fit a stairway and a uh, work platform that I'll show you in a second here on the port side of the boat. Um, this shows kind of just a front view of the boat shed with uh, at the height of the middle of the deck and, and a six foot person standing on there. So there should be good headroom in there. I want to make this a really nice boat shed because it, we're going to spend a lot of time there over the next uh, few years. And, um, and, and I put in a little extra effort into making it a nice place to work. Here's the um, uh, front view of the south wall. Um, we've got um, uh, 14 by foot high by 13 foot wide uh, pair of doors here um, and and then we've got here's one of those windows from the um, from the um, uh, wind tunnel um, and that's where that's going to go uh, and there's a man door here um, every I'll point out there's the five foot up the walls the first foot is going to be pressure treated plywood and then there's a four foot pieces of ply four by eights on edge. So we're gonna have five feet of plywood up the first straight section of wall. Everything touching the ground is gonna be pressure treated. Um, and and, um, and, and the, the straight walls will let us put uh, benches along there, or hang things, uh, use it for storage and so on. Here's the north wall, um, just gonna be a plain wall. It'll have a man door in, in, in it as well. And here's two the other two wind tunnel windows. Um, and these will be opening windows, allow us to get some ventilation in there when it's hot. Um, here's the doors uh, um, and um, the details for the doors. And then here's the, um, the work platform and stairs. And then um, lastly, here's kind of some details on the, um, on the, uh, the bow itself. Um, we had um, the lumber delivered the other day, uh, and so it is here now. We have most of the detail, our hardware needed to build the boat shed, and so um, 
um, got that there. And um, hopefully when you guys join us next on our next episode, we'll have some significant progress. Now that we've got the wind tunnel out of the garage, we've got a place we can work on the boat uh, or the boat shed parts in comfort. And uh, we'll get going on that. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, as always, thank you for uh, everybody who's viewing. Um, thank you for the likes, comments, subscriptions. Uh, and we will see you next time on Journey of Sailing Yacht Syrinx.